This is the web transcription service of the Royal Canadian Military Institute. On March the 6th, Military History Night heard a presentation from retired historian, writer, and member of the 1805 Club, retired U.S. Navy Captain John Rodgard, on the heroic wartime career of HMS Venomous, a hard-fought ship. John, the floor is yours. Thank you, Thank you so much. Thank you, Pat, so very, very much. And good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Um, it is really a pleasure, beyond words, uh, to have this invitation to be with you tonight. Uh, it is, it's a little chilly here, I might add. Um, my, uh, my wife, Judy Pearson, is with, with me tonight. And uh, I might also take the time to uh, shout out to fellow members of the 1805 Club that are here. Mr. Ian Russell, Mr. Mark Billings, Mr. Ron Anderson, Judy Pearson, who else did I forget? Did I forget anyone else? And maybe and potentially more members of the 1805 Club. Uh, the 1805 Club's mission is the preservation of the history and heritage of the Royal Navy between George I and George IV and Nelson's memory. So, and I'm the North American Secretary, how's that? Anyway, I just want to recognize uh, my fellow 1805 Club members, and I'm glad you could be here. Well, yes, uh, one person who said uh, to this evening, I'm very curious about the title, Venomous and Valor and a Common Virtue. How does that all fit together? Well, the Oxford Dictionary defines valor quite simply as, quote, courage in the face of danger. As for virtue, Oxford states, quote, behavior showing a high moral standard, a morally good or desirable quality, a good or useful quality of a thing. Two generations of sailors who served on Venomous exemplified the definition of valor, and as such, they were so very typical. Common as with all those who have ever served under the White Ensign during the historically tragic and, yes, triumphal years at sea during the first half of the 20th century. Triumphal because our world would have looked a lot different if the Royal Navy failed. Well, we include the Royal Canadian Navy and the Royal Australian Navy and the Royal New Zealand Navy if they failed. They also share a common understanding that all sailors have of the inherent danger of being at sea. That the sea is remorseless in its leveling of human vanity, and I believe that all of you here would agree with me on that. Now the center of the photograph that you see was taken just after Venomous was placed into commission in 1919. The photos around the edges are of some of the men who served in her during the Second War. Now it's also a testament to the common quality of the ship. Venomous and her sisters were the latest in a series of 23 separate class names and 18 distinct classes of destroyers built for the Royal Navy between 1906 and 1920. When she was commissioned in 1919, Venomous was the most advanced destroyer in the world. But Venomous was common in that she was one of 67 of her extended class. This is the largest number of destroyers in a single class, subclass, built for the Royal Navy. To Rudyard Kipling, Venomous and her sisters were the epitome of what a destroyer was. Do any of you know that he, in 1898, wrote a poem titled The Destroyer? Neither did I. And in his poem, The Destroyers, his poetic license saw this type of ship as the, quote, the flash, dash, and boom of naval warfare. To him, they were, quote, the maidens of the slain. Well, yes, Venomous was uh, common among her sisters in that regard. She was sleek, 
possessing a handsome hull line. She had speed and her pr pr principal weapon, the torpedo, carried quite a boom. It's common to say that the quality of her features and that of her class would be replicated by the future Royal Navy class of destroyers as well as other classes of destroyers from other navies all the way through the rest of the century. We can see in this photograph Venomous as she appeared out from John Brown. She's right there in the lower right side. And one of her sisters is being fitted out on the other side. After only 10 years of commission, she was placed in reserve in 1929. Now, what's interesting is that what you could see in the background is a very large ship. Can anybody tell me who that ship is? This, is, this was taken in 1919, HMS Hood. And ironically, <clears throat> Venomous, the day before Hood was lost, was escorting a convoy eastbound. It was a Halifax convoy. Um, she is one of the last ships to see Hood as Hood and Prince of Wales and five destroyers race westward and of course the next day Hood blew up. So it's kind of ironic that you have this photograph of her fitting out with, with her and then seeing Hood for the last time. Now, right after she was commissioned, this is her and that's how she would look for the 10 years that she was in commission service, unchanged. But during the 1920s, Venomous and her men were very busy, and within a few months after her commissioning, she was directed to join the Forgotten Fleet, the Baltic Squadron under Admiral Cohen. This was right after the Great War, and the Baltic states are trying to um, obtain their freedom from what was Imperial Russia, as well as trying to fight off a freebooting German army. And it was the Royal Navy that ensured the three Baltic states their freedom, up until obviously the Second War. We see that through such men that I wrote about. His name, he was a young midshipman. His first ship was Venomous. His name was Renfro Gotto, G-O-T-T-O. And as a young midshipman, he would spend hours on that open bridge. Okay? And in his memoirs that I was able to, 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 to obtain, he was so happy that he was finally sent down to the engine room to keep warm. So, as you can imagine, as a young officer, he was going through all the different roles and responsibilities. So he felt very, very good to be in Venomous's engineering plant. Now she returned from the Baltic. They're pretty happy about that. Uh, she would spend time as guard ship in Queenstown, Cove, during the Irish Civil War. And then in 1921, she was ordered to the Mediterranean, where she would spend the rest of her time in commission in the Med with the Mediterranean fleet, in and out of Malta. We see her life through an unknown stoker. It was very rare for enlisted personnel to have diaries. And Judy and I ran into a three-volume diary by this, and we have no idea who he was, which resides in the Royal Navy Museum in Portsmouth. And he writes about such things as exercises that his ship was on, back in port. And of course, exercises had difficulties. This is a British C-class cruiser with her bow stoved in. Things happen. Torpedo exercises. Venomous was escort to HMS Eagle. And I want you to remember that. Uh, so she was involved with the very embryonic development, evolution of the development of uh, British carrier aviation. She also did what we call the, uh, the cruising cycle with the fleet. The cruising cycle, you had one in springtime, the summer, and autumn. Literally, the fleet would go around the Med, showing the flag. 
She would also, and there she is back again, she would also did a stint in the Red Sea on anti-slavery patrol. Uh, during the Great War, the Royal Navy had suspended its uh, slavery patrol, anti-slavery patrol in the Red Sea, obviously war considerations. But um, with the rise of the Saudi Arabian Kingdom, uh, <clears throat> the British ambassador had witnessed slaves being brought across Africa into, into the Arabian Peninsula under the guise of, being, of going to uh, Mecca for the uh, pilgrimage, but being enslaved by the Saudis. So the Royal Navy instituted its anti-slavery patrol in 1922, and Venomous was part of that. And of course, life in Malta during this time was be a life of a very fascinating life. I mean, you think about, for officers, obviously, you had the polo clubs, you had all kinds of events, and the dining, and you know, you name it. The social life was quite active. For the enlisted person, there were the bars and whatnot. But uh, life was pretty good. As I said in 1929, because of, well, look what was happening to the Navy with Britain's economy. Here she is only nine, 10 years old and she was placed in the reserve with a very, very slim chance of ever seeing, how can I say, cold water or warm water again. But in 1939, Venomous is back, just as Winston Churchill. The second generation of men who brought the ship back to life consisted of regular Navy, reserve and recalled retired men. Lieutenant Commander Donald McIntyre, who had just come back commanding a brand new British destroyer in Hong Kong. Now, who knows of Donald McIntyre? McIntyre became one of Royal Navy's great post-war historians. During the war, he became one of the Royal Navy's great U-boat killers. He brings Venomous back to life. By the end of August 39, he felt confident that all was ready. But his initial impression upon seeing her was telling. He wrote, my gloom returned when I sought out from amongst the mass of mass of old VNW destroyers living in the dockyard basin, the particular old warrior that had been selected for me. Now others were less generous. One sailor wrote back to his wife, what a ship to look at. His a messmate, able seaman Harold Napton wrote this to his wife, this is the old tub. In fact, I have the postcard that he wrote to his wife, and that is the postcard uh, photograph of Venomous. Now, events moved quickly, and at 1100 hours on 3 September, Prime Minister Chamberlain announced that Britain was now at war, and so was McIntyre's old warrior. His account is sobering and timeless. The ship's company was mustered on the quarterdeck. McIntyre read the read the uh, Articles of War. Upon completion, he told them to fall out and carry on. That's how Venomous entered the war. And later that day, oh yeah, I forgot, there was another name for Venomous, Verminous. I mean, it's, you know, we like to play with British Royal Navy names like HMS inc Incompatible, Incontinent, you know, you know, those kinds of names being so Verminus was Venomous's <clears throat> teasing name. But on that day, that afternoon, here's a photograph taken from Venomous. She joined her three other sisters, uh, forming the 19th Destroyer Flotilla. And I want you to remember that. Now, we're going to jump forward to 1940. 79 years ago this year, specifically May and June 1940. Now, I've selected this moment because during this time, the ship's fate and that of her men and all of Britain and her empire and commonwealth, for that matter, hung in the balance, hung on a thread. Venomous was in Portsmouth for repairs after being ran by a tug, and therefore she missed the disastrous Norwegian campaign. She has a noose captain, Lieutenant Commander John McBeath from South Africa. 
John would bring the old girl through some of the horrendous situations that this ship would experience over the next four weeks. Now this is May through early June 1940. Now, on 2 May, McBeath took Venomous out on a routine East Coast convoy. This continued for only one week when a message reached her to abandon her charge and race to Dover. The battle for France had begun. For the next 24 hours, Venomous would make countless dashes across the channel. She came close to being sunk by the Luftwaffe on more than one occasion. On 11 May, McBeath took her to the Dutch coast to pick up a Dutch military mission to liaise with the BEF. Back to Dover that night, the ship was ordered to embark 100 Royal Marines and take them to the Hook of Holland so that the Marines could destroy the dock works. That morning, Venomous, <clears throat> that morning, Venomous experienced her first bombing. And as able seaman James A. Eaton said after one such Stuka attack, with bombs exploding all around her, he said, I thought we were goners. But as another said, ah, but she's a tough old bird. Yes, she was. But she also had an excellent captain who had innate tactical skills, John McBeath, and I want you to remember that name. John would eventually retire as a Royal Rear Admiral, and his last service was ADC to Queen Elizabeth in 1957. Now, it was at this point that Venomous shot her first aircraft down. Now, she returned to Harwich, and for the next, through the 12th, she took up what we call the Goodwin Patrol. It was basically sorting out of Harwich and taking this line of bearing back and forth towards Holland and back again to intercept German mine laying operations as well as to be in a position to rescue. You could imagine there was an exodus of small boats and whatever coming out of Holland at the time. And in fact, it was on the 15th of May that on the Goodwin patrol she saw this boat flying a Dutch flag. There are 46 people on this 15-meter boat. It was a Dutch lifeboat belonging to the Dutch lifeboat service. Her name was Siemens Soup, Siemens Hope. On board, four young men had commandeered the boat out of Swavenen. These four men, young men, were high school students. And they were going to take the boat and they're going to go and they're going to go to Amsterdam and they're going to fight the Germans. Well, at the dockyard that night, all these people were trying to get away. So they took them on board. Now there are 46 souls on this baby. She, when Venomous saw her, she was dead in the water. The engine had run out of petrol. And she was basically heading on her way down through the Straits of Dover into the English Channel and if no one found her they were going to be flushed right out into the Atlantic Ocean. Venomous found them. McBeath brought Venomous alongside, brought, and this is a photograph taken of them. They were German and Dutch Jews. Siemens soup survived. In fact what was fascinating was that Abel Seaman Napton I mentioned Commander McBeath went up to him and said, Napton, do you know which way is Ramsgate? And Nap Napton said, that way. He said, great, take another able seaman and take a stoker and take the seaman soup to Ramsgate. And she survived. In 2015, on the 15th of May, there was a reunion. There is the seaman soup with two of the four men who took her out, and there was a reunion of family members, children and grandchildren of those people who were rescued. The center, the lady with the sunglasses, Dame Hennig. She is a member of the House of Lords, and that's her family. 
She was born in a um, camp on the Isle of Man when her mother and father were interned until they could prove that they weren't Nazis. And she was born on the Isle of Man uh, back in 1943. Well, Venomous, after that, continued her patrol on the, uh, Goodwin, on the Goodwin line. And uh, that evening, on this particular time, the German, these type of German seaplanes were mine layers. And the Germans were intercepting British ships, whatever they could find, and they were using mines as bombs. And during this evolution, Venomous was attacked by three of them. And several of these mines came extremely close very close, some as close as 10 yards away, believe it or not. Venomous was a very well-built ship. She was able to overcome those near misses and she, in fact shot her second aircraft down. She then began running to Calais and it was during this time that she picked up, there was a very super secret anti-submarine warfare station at Sangetti, outside of Calais. Plus, there were a lot of Anglo-French, you know, Calais has a, it's been a center for, for the English for many years. And she took off dozens of refugees as well as the Royal Navy personnel. Great photograph of them. And here she is alongside, and there's, look at the trucks there, the train, and there's, ref, there's uh, British and, and French citizens that she's taking on board. She would take a couple hundred at a time. And also during this time, the docks were being bombed by the Luftwaffe. And in fact, this was just after a raid and people who had been in the boxcars also were underneath the cars to be for protection. And Venomous was absolutely, there's nothing she could do. She was moored alongside, incredibly lucky. Nothing came close. Now, on the 22nd of May, or actually the 21st, the imperial staff made a decision, and of course Churchill is prime minister, that Calais and Boulogne would be defended. They would be exit points for the BEF. On the 21st of May, Venomous is escorting the ship named the Mona Queen, and on board are elements of the 2nd Battalion Welsh Guards, the 2nd Battalion Irish Guards. They formed the 20th Guards Brigade, and they were ordered to go to Boulogne and defend, create a defensive perimeter. Here's Venomous. There are members of, there the, there's the members of the uh, Welsh and Irish Guards. There's the Mona Queen disembarking before they're going into the town and to the outskirts. And at the same time, Venomous picked up dozens of refugees, including a girls' orphanage. You can see some of them down there. There she is leaving Boulogne. Now, <laughs> There was an uh, orphanage of, for girls run, I, for, I forget the name of the uh, order of sisters who were running the, the, the orphanage. They were the impression that Venomous was going to take them down the coast of Cherbourg. No, that didn't happen. They wound up back in England. But there was a sister organization, and these girls were, uh, were sent up to a, a, a stately home in Scotland where they basically lived out the war. As of two years ago, two of these girls were still alive and were living in France. Are you getting a bit of a theme here? Now, the ship is a destroyer. Have you noticed something that's trending here? She's saving lives, a lot of lives. This is an official painting of, uh, in fact, this is uh, the gentleman you see at the left is Brigadier uh, Fox Pitt. <clears throat> and together with the uh, commanding officer of Stanier, there's his familiar you are with the geography of this town. It's an ancient city. Well, it's surrounded, it's like a open bowl.
outside the town. However, the slightly armed advancing panzers for It was street fighting with panzers and supporting infantry methodically going house to house and capturing the surrounding hillsides. And by the afternoon of 23 May, the guardsmen had retreated across the swing bridge that connected the eastern part of the town from the principal port area of the town on the west bank of the river. As I mentioned, this is a painting from the Welsh guards showing, showing the senior officers and men coming through the town. Here is a signal from Vice Admiral Dover, who at the time was Admiral Ramsey. It reads the following. Most immediate to Withshed, Vimy, Venetia, and Venomous, from Vice Admiral Dover. Inform Buttercup evacuation. The name of the evacuation of Boulogne was Buttercup. All troops as soon as possible use destroyers. The Mera, which was another VNW, will be joining you. Wild Swan later. That was another W. She was one of my favorite names, Wild Swan. Captain Simpson, who was commander of the destroyer flotilla 19, was on the scene at the time, and he directed HMS Vimy to follow him in HMS Keith into Boulogne. Now, during the 1700 hours, Venomous joined five other VNWs and five French destroyers who had been engaging German army units along the French coast. And shortly after Venomous joined the group, they were jumped by 60 Stuka dive bombers. During the engagement, one French destroyer received a thousand pound bomb amidships and disintegrated. Another French destroyer was also mortally wounded. None of the British destroyers were hit. But in this artistic rendition of her, she was able to outmaneuver the bombs. She was riddled a bit. Three of her men were slightly wounded, but she came out of it. Now, the two gentlemen on the Bridge of Venomous on the right is John McBeath and his first lieutenant, a gentleman named Angus McKenzie, who retired to Halifax, and his family live in Halifax this day. Mackenzie would wind up uh, commanding a beautiful C-class destroyer, emergency class destroyer during the war, and retired and, well, didn't retire, he left the Navy, and, uh, and emigrated to Nova Scotia, and his family lived there today. Anyway, what transpired was, here they are watching the f first three ships coming in. Keith and Femi came in. They began to take men aboard. The Germans now are in those townhouses, they're on the hillside, it's like a barrel of fish. I mean, there's nothing. The Captain Simpson is shot in the head by a sniper on his bridge. The other commanding officer, uh, comm uh, Lieutenant Commander Donald, which his, his ship Vimy was his first command, is also shot in the head by a sniper. Most of the uh, bridge crew on both of those destroyers are hit. Uh, the Germans open up with uh, small arms, machine guns, you name it, and riddling those two ships. When Venomous saw those two ships move out, the blood running down the sides of those ships from dead and wounded uh, army personnel was, uh, one of the gentlemen wrote, he said it was unbelievable to see that sight. Well, guess what? It's Venomous's turn to go in. This is around, this photograph was taken from Venomous. The ship on the right is Wild Swan. The one on the left is Venetia. And this photograph was taken by Lieutenant Kearsaw. Wild Swan went in first, Venomous went in second, and Venetia would come in third. Wild Swan comes in, quiet. The firing has stopped. Venomous comes in. This drawing is by Chief Artificer McGinty, showing the alignment of the ships going in. You can see Wild Swan pulled into the quayside where the train station was. 
and her port side is being protected by the huge building. Now, Venomous had come in, and the army wanted Venomous to tie alongside Vimy. But McBeath, seeing the tactical situation, decided to uh, come alongside on the exposed side of the key wall. And Venetia would come in third. Now, there was a reason there was quiet. The Germans were waiting for the third ship to come in. And when they, she came in, they opened up like you would not believe. Here is where Venomous pulled in. This photograph was taken about three years ago by my publisher. Wild Swan was in that side. And Venetia is coming in. Here's a photograph taken showing Wild Swan. And you see a ship on fire in the middle. That is Venetia. What transpired was the Germans opened up. Two large caliber rounds went and slammed into a bridge, knocked out B-mount, killed and wounded everyone on the bridge. She began, she lost control and started to go towards the key walls, the breakwater. If it wasn't for a very young 18-year-old midshipman named David Jones, he rushed from his action station, went on to the bridge and ordered under heavy fire his destroyer to back out at 18 knots and got her out of the channel before she could be sunk. So despite everything that you're about to hear, what Venomous did and Wild Swan would have gone to naught if it wasn't for this young man, 18 years old. Unfortunately, Venetia would be lost in the Thames estuary about a month later. She would be sunk by a German magnetic mind, and David Jones would go down with her a month later. This photograph shows from Venomous, look how close those buildings are on the opposite side. There's a hill on top and you can see a lot of smoke. That is from a French fort that had just been captured by the Germans and they used those guns they were using on Venetia. McBeath ordered his gunnery officer to open up the, with the four, 4.7s. The first salvo went over the fort. The second salvo slammed into the fort, blew the facing off, and took all the guns out. The next salvo went after a German light artillery battery that was setting up next to the fort and scattered them. Now, Venomous is alongside for just 35 minutes, and during this time, her crewmen, who have Enfield rifles, uh, Bren guns, Lewis guns, plus the pom-pom gun from Venomous and her 4.7s, are opening up a German infantry and armor. Venomous is the first ship of recorded naval history to fire against German against armor over open sites at point blank range. She cleared the streets. She cleared the snipers out of the trees. She and during this entire time, 500 guardsmen are coming on board. 500. Venomous is alongside for just 35 minutes. There's a young sub. There's a young young uh, sub lieutenant named Wells, who's on the forecastle of Venomous. His job, he's laying prone on the forecastle. His job is to tend the spring line. Venomous is being kept alongside by just engines, so she has a bow line and she's being kept alongside, and the guards are coming down. Oh, by the way, the tide is dropping. There's a twenty-some foot tidal range. So what's happening is Venomous is sinking lower and lower in the water, which also saved her, made her less of a target. 35 minutes, Pitt Fox says, please stay, please stay. And, and, and McBeath says, I can't. I've got to leave. So he orders Wells to let go the spring line forward. He orders all back full. The rudder jams hard to starboard. Could you imagine this sight? You have the guardsmen joining their Royal Navy enlisted personnel with their weapons. The big guns are going off. The Germans are firing back. I mean, she's being hit with multiple rounds of machine gun and small arms fire. And she proceeds stern first at 18 knots out through that narrow channel. What an incredible situation. Oh, by the way, not one man was hit. Not one man at all. She turns around and just with her engines, he, she races back to Dover at 30 knots. 
That was the 23rd of May, 1940. And if I can read this, yeah, here she is going out, and you could see the flames from, these were what were British trucks, and all the buildings there are Germans. You could see it's all pockmarked, and the woods have been cleared out of German snipers. Now, this is a signal. Oh, that gentleman there was a, a telegraphist with Venomous during his entire time in the Navy was on Venomous, and he kept signals. I've got a copies of those signals. And this is two dest Dover destroyers from Vice Admiral Dover, Admiral Ramsey. I wish to express my ad admiration of the manner in which the destroyers attached to the Dover Command carried out the difficult operation of evacuating the troops from Boulogne last. In the face of heavy air attack and point blank fire from guns, machine guns, and snipers, the handling of the ships and their armaments and the bearing of the ship's companies was beyond all praise. The following from the Imperial General Staff. Army's thanks to your people for last night's magnificent effort blown. Venomous received a message from Commander-in-Chief Western Approaches. We are all proud to welcome you to Plymouth after your splendid work. Ladies and gentlemen, this was just the beginning. Dunkirk. This photograph was taken uh, of Venomous off of Bray Dunes. This photograph is Bray Dunes. Who saw the movie Dunkirk? All right. Does that photograph look familiar in a way? There, you know, that part of the beach was a holiday area. Look at the troops along on the beach. You could see Venomous with one of her longboats. Well, it was decided getting the men off the beach was, it wasn't going to work. Ramsey orders the destroyers into the port itself, and Venomous makes several runs into Dunkirk. This was a photograph taken by Kersaw as, as Venomous enters Dunk, uh, Dunkirk itself. Here she, that, this is not Venomous, this is an A-class destroyer together with a merchant ship, probably a cross-channel packet. Now, look at, here's the, there's the breakwater. Look at all the troops on the breakwater. Now, on the 31st, excuse me, on the 31st of May, Venomous was back uh, in Dover, ready to rearm refuel, and get ready to go back out. She gets underway on the 12th, at 1200 on the 31st. She's out at sea for about an hour. She receives a signal from Dover saying, return. Ramsey made the decision because we had by that time lost six destroyers and other smaller ships, uh, Royal Navy ships, as well as dozens of commercial traffic type vessels. He orders that there will no longer be daylight rescue, it will be done at night. Venomous turns around and waits until the evening of the 31st. And you can imagine, here's the photograph taken by her at 11 o'clock at night. And I'm sure all of you are aware of what the daylight is up this part of the world in May and June. This was the early morning hours, I mean the late morning, uh, late evening hours of 31 May and 1 June. These are very British troops she took. She took she made two more runs, and the last run she made was that evening of the 2nd of June, and she pulled off 1,400 French soldiers in one go. Venomous was lucky, to say the least. There was only one other destroyer that rescued more men. Venomous rescued, during her runs into Dunkirk, 4,400 men. Gee, a bit of a theme is really carrying through, isn't it? Now, Venomous, uh, McBeath leaves Venomous, and uh, another able commander takes her, and uh, there she is up at the top. She almost doesn't make it to Londonderry, where she's going to be the flagship for the uh, 21st uh, Escort Flotilla, when she is mined off of Liverpool, and she has a very considerable structural damage, but no one's wounded, no one's hurt. 
She comes out of that after four months in the yard and takes up her uh, duty stations of Londonderry and begins her convoy escort role across the Atlantic. I haven't been able to nail it down, but I know uh, some of the members who had written, crew members, had written saying that she was in Halifax on several occasions. But she was a short-range escort. I mean, she was designed during the, for the Great War period to operate in the North Sea, so she didn't have the legs. What she would do, she would escort a convoy to the mid-ocean point and then shoot up to Iceland to refuel and then come back out again to catch a convoy heading eastward. Okay, that's what she was doing. Now, after Pitcairn left, there was another very good officer named Hugh Falcon Stewart. Now, as you can see, she was still considered a value ship because she was being commanded by full commanders. Who Falcon Steward would take her through some of the most horrendous actions of the battle for the Atlantic to include going into the Mediterranean as part of Operation Pedestal, the relief of Malta. There is, uh, the, the destroyer there is HMS Keppel. The uh, skipper is John J Jackie Broom. You might have heard of him. He was one of the great U-boat killers of the Second War. Well, that was after that destroyer almost sank Venomous and collided off of, I um, off of Ireland. And uh, Venomous was almost lost. What's interesting is that I told you about a tug hitting her that she misses the Norwegian campaign. Then she's rammed by a fellow destroyer and almost sinks. But then what happens with her? She goes to Scotland and is refitted. And she comes out looking like that at the bottom. She becomes a true ASW escort. Her forward gun is, uh, is, uh, is taken off and she has Hedgehog. She has radar, the Type 271 radar. She has other, she has a Type 286 radar. She has more depth charge throwers and more depth charges. So she is truly, truly an escort destroyer. No longer a fleet destroyer. So she's no longer a Greyhound. She is basically a sheepdog. She enters the Mediterranean as part of Operation Pedestal. The photograph at the top shows HMS Eagle. Remember I mentioned she was with Eagle in the 20s? And there's HMS Eagle on her death roll after being struck by four torpedoes from a German U-boat. That picture was taken by uh, Lieutenant Kearsall. Venomous again picks up 500 survivors from Gibraltar and heads back at 30 knots. Oh, by the way, because she's so top-heavy, she can't zigzag, while her sister ships are zigzagging, escorting HMS Furious, which was an aircraft carrier that carried Spitfires to Malta. Venomous cannot zigzag because she'll roll if she does. But she goes back to Gibraltar with 500 men at 30 knots. Under Hugh Falcon Stewart, this is the 8th of November, 1942, Operation Torch, the invasion of North Africa by Anglo-American, by the Anglo-American Army. Venomous is in Gibraltar, and she is ordered, together with a brand new British destroyer, HMS Marne, to escort as Admiral Cunningham said, two very important ships. They're both destroyer depot ships. One is named Hecla, and the other one is named Vindictive. And Marne and Venomous are ordered to escort them to Gibraltar, because they'll repair ships that are hit in action. Unfortunately, they run up against one of Hitler's great U-boat aces, Werner Henke. That's him on the right. And that's U-515 his Type 9 submarine. During the time, what I call a very, very long night, Venomous, working with Marne, ward off this incredible U-boat commander. Henka sinks the Hecla. There are now 600 men in the water. The Marne has her stern blown off by the U-515. And during the entire, that early, that evening and the morning hours of the 12th of November, Venomous is on a one-to-one -one duel against one of Hitler's great U-boat aces. 
she manages to beat the hell out of that ship, that submarine, and forces Henke to withdraw. Now Venomous is picking up and picks up 500 men out of the water. He is ordered to return to Gibraltar, but Hugh Falcon Stewart, with his engineering officer and navigation officer, his engineering officer says, we don't have enough fuel to get to Gibraltar. Falcon Stewart over the radio hears that Casablanca had just been liberated the day before. So he heads out that afternoon. Two Canadian corvettes come to help H HMS Marne get back into port. He leaves Marne and proceeds at 12 knots. The stokers are scraping the forward fuel tanks, literally scraping the fuel tanks to get buckets of oil to put into the after fuel tanks so Venomous can make it. And sure enough, she does. She makes it into Casablanca with 500 survivors and comes alongside a U.S. aircraft carrier. Well, first the USS Augusta, the cruiser, who was the uh, flagship of Admiral Hewitt, who was the uh, U.S. Task Force Commander for Casablanca. And with the Americans helping the survivors, they're showered, fed, U.S. Navy clothes, uniforms, and the next day, Venomous leaves and heads for Gibraltar with 500 men aboard. Now, she continues in the Mediterranean. She's escorting convoys as the Allies are moving west to east across Morocco and through Algeria to Tunis. And then she also takes part in Operation Husky, the invasion of Sicily. And by October of 1943, she is literally worn out. She can only do 20 knots, and she's ordered back to Britain to be converted to a long-range escort. However, that doesn't happen. She's placed on a mud bank in Falmouth and sits there from 1943 through 44. What's going to happen in 44? Operation, oh, yep. Yeah. They need the dockyards for other purposes. So Venema sits on a mud flat until August of 44. And there she is at the top. She's stripped just about everything. And she's made into a target ship. And she's off the Isle of Man training Barracuda pilots with the fleet air arm. And these Barracuda pilots would join the fast carriers to fight the Japanese in the Pacific. And then she would go to Scotland to the East Coast in the Firth of Forth, where she had been sitting when she had first been pulled, put into reserve status. She sat there for 10 years. Now she's operating out of the same area as a target ship. But she has one last duty. She and a sister ship, HMS Valorous, go to Christiansen, Norway. And there they take the surrender of the German Navy North. The next day, she's ordered back to Scotland. And the day following that, she is decommissioned and sent over to where the reserve fleet is at. Her life ends on the 10th, I'm sorry, the 12th of May, 1945. The last piece of her is scrapped on November 1948. You see that picture there? And you see the arrow? There is a young man who is a Canadian. He is his name is Arthur Homer McPhee, M-C-P-H-E-E. -E. He was a very popular officer on Venomous. He uh, was born in 1926 in Vancouver and joined the Royal Navy as a boy sailor and rose to petty officer. He was commissioned in 1940 and joined Venomous. He left Venomous in 43, commanding a hunt free, hunt free uh, destroyer, escort destroyer in the Mediterranean. He transferred to the RCN in 1947. He retired as a captain in 1974, the longest serving officer in the Royal Canadian Navy. He died in 2006 back in British Columbia. That's, his nickname was Homer, Arthur McVie. Very tall and slim gentleman. Now, 
thus passed a very hard-fought ship. And she was common in that way. Venomous was all too typical of her sister's sister VNWs, common in the qualities of her design, common in that two generations of Royal Navy men, regulars, reservists, retired, retained, and hostilities only served aboard her. In their way, the men of Venomous showed courage that was common as all of their fellows who served, for that matter. Common courage in the face of an unforgiving sea and against a determined enemy. Yes, Venomous was a very hard-fought ship and a very lucky one at that. And I'll leave you with the final words uh, that Abel Seaman James Eaton told me, what he said about Venomous. She was a happy ship, and I was very, very proud to serve in her. And I would do so again. Good old Venomous. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I, I, I want to conclude with just one thing. I want to read a passage to you. Here's a book, and you're more than happy to see this book. I, well, Judy and I found this in England last year. It is a book of poetry. Actually, it's long. It's a single poem. It's titled, Who Dare to Live? And it was written by Frederick W. Watt, W-A-T-T, -T, Lieutenant Commander, R-C-N-V-R. And it was dedicated to two other RCNVR officers, Lieutenant J.C. Dwyer, RCNVR, missing September 26, 1942, and Commander F.R.W.R. Gow, G.O.W., RCN, missing November 7, 1942. And this is Who Dare to Live. I have loved ships too much, perhaps, for my own good. God help us, sentimental chaps, when steel and wood and faithful craftsmanship can so contrive to work their spell, until that alchemy becomes alive and in you as well. A brave man dies but once, I've heard, and who am I to doubt a poet's or a brave man's word? We others try to join the ragged band who share the mortal pain of death repeated, yet who dare to live again. Thank you. Well, certainly, I guess, uh, how's the time situation? <laughs> I'll be more than happy to take questions. If any, yes, Carol. John, this isn't actually a question, but I would like to give Venomous another nickname. Uh -oh, not ver verminous? Not verminous, no. Because Venomous is a proud name, but it's also a bit of a scary name. Verminous. The nasty name. I would like to give her the nickname Benevolent because she rescued so many. Very nice. I mean, think about it. I've estimated she saved somewhere between 7,000 lives. During her time. And I, as that example, if I may, just seeing that picture of Dame Hennig with her children and her grandchildren, there were 145 family members on that day on the 15th of May, 2015, when Judy and I were there. What about the others? How many thousands of others? Children and grandchildren. I mean, really, you know? Yes, well, thank you. Yes? Did you, have you uh, seen any record of whether Venice was equipped with either Aztec or depth charges when the war started, which was essentially an anti-submarine war? The Germans right, right. Yes, yes, yes. She, she, she had some? Oh, yes, she had Aztec, and uh, she was fitted with Aztec. Mm -hmm. And she had um, she had a four pattern depth charge load. She had a uh, single K um, um, yeah K gun uh, just aft for the um, uh, superstructure, and then she had two um, two racks. So she had a basically we call a four spread. Okay, when she came out of the yards at, uh, in Scotland in '42, she she had a uh, she had a six pattern. Plus she also, and the torpedo tubes that she had, the center torpedo tube had a 2,000 pound, basically death bomb, death bomb that would be shot out of the tube, a 2,000 pound warhead. 
Now, it was never used for an obvious reason, because if that thing went off in close proximity to Venomous, it would not only sink the German submarine, but take her down to the bottom as well. The Canadian destroyers were fitted with a, a Mark 19 depth charge as well. It was a, essentially a torpedo. Yeah, but that was it, yeah. It just went off and dropped. Oh, yeah. I mean, they could you imagine? I worried about it. I know yeah. one destroyer was working with another one, it dropped it, and it didn't go off. And they suggested maybe the senior officer would come and drop the next pattern. <laughs> well, Venomous also had a hedgehog. What was interesting, she never used it against Henka, and the reason why was it was just shortly after uh, one of the um, A-class destroyers that had, it had a hedgehog fitted and exploded. And so they, uh, the, the Admiralty ordered n no, not to use the hedgehog until they found out why it happened. So that's why, and that's why, that's why Venomous didn't use the hedgehog against Henka. If she had, oh, by the way, Henka's luck ran out. Uh, the day before D-Day, 1944, and he was captured, and his crew, who survived, by then Captain Gallery of the um, Guadalcanal Hunter Killer Group. And this man was placed in a secret hush-hush prisoner of war camp for high-value German officers just outside of Washington, D.C. Henke committed suicide by guard because <clears throat> Office of Naval Intelligence personnel were threatening to turn him to the British if he did not give up more secrets. And of course he had every right not to. The reason why he was being threatened to go back because he had, su he had sunk a fast cargo transport named the um, Ceramic that had 800 women and children on board had left England unescorted and in the middle of the South Atlantic between Brazil and West Africa, Henke found her, didn't know, torpedoed her. Only one person survived, and it was a soldier. All the others went down. Yeah, 800 women and children, as well as the ship's company. Now, what happened was, Henke was made a hero, and Goebbels used him, and it became announced uh, obviously, the British knew what happened to Ceramic. Well, we, naval intelligence personnel, were using that as a leverage to get him to talk. First of all, we were not going to give him to the British because a U-boat commander was rarer than hen's teeth. And secondly, the British would never have hanged him anyway. So what did he do on a lovely June day of 1944? Well, actually, it was, it was August 44, if I remember correctly. He committed suicide by guard. He was under so much pressure that he climbed the wire and a guard with a Thompson submachine gun just ripped him up. And he is buried at Fort Meade Cemetery. And each year, there are other Germans there as well, uh, the German embassy lays flowers on his grave. Yeah. Sure poetry book. I knew Freddie Watt. I met him several times. Well, here it he is. in charge of merchant ship inspection in Halifax for much of the war set up mm -hmm. because they were worried about spies putting stuff on board and maybe sending crews mm -hmm. and so on. And Freddie Watt uh, set up a, a group of them, most ex-merchant uh, seamen in, in the Navy, RCNR, uh, to inspect the, each of the ships <coughs> and set up a library service because they, they found there weren't any spies, that wasn't a problem, but Right. They were sitting around doing nothing, so Fred Watt set up uh, through the uh, volunteers in Halifax library service. So he's an interesting guy, apart from writing poetry as well. So you are familiar with this then? Yes, yeah, I have a copy. You have a copy of this? Yeah, it's 1944. To DM from MFR, October 44. So, any, yeah, yes, sir. To, to ask some question, has the RC wife littered these sorts of artifacts? Is there any piece of venomous left anywhere? Well, the ship's crest was. Um, let's see. If I go all the way back, you saw the crest in the beginning. Uh, it was um, with training ship venomous. <sighs> Four years ago, the training ship, the building, caught on fire. It was a, uh, um, a warmer, short-circuited. You know, you put a teapot on there for warming. 
and burned the place down, and Venomous's crest melted. But yes, there had been one up until four years ago. It was Venomous's crest that you would. In fact, there's a great photograph in the book showing the quarterdeck, and there it is. Yes. Any other questions, sir? Um, in one of the last shots that you had, mm -hmm. it looked as though Venomous' uh, identification number was I-75. Yes. Yeah. There. Yeah. Because she was no longer she was no longer frontline destroyer. That's a good question. <laughs> yeah, it's the next line. Yeah, I seventy five. But she kept her number, but yeah, it was changed to I. There she is, right there. See? See how she was altered? In fact, I was able to demonstrate that she has that configuration that looks like a long range escort. A lot of the VNWs had their forward funnel removed and her forward boilers removed, so they and with extra fuel tanks, so they could make it across the Atlantic. Because, as I mentioned earlier, Venomous didn't have the legs because they weren't designed for that long range. That's why a lot of people, including some very prominent historians, have said that Venomous was a long range escort, but she was never, she was never made into a long range escort. I was able to show that with photographs and whatever, and that, that's not the case. But she was, basically became a target ship. <laughs> and Royal Navy Paracudas would fire dummy torpedoes at her. At her. Men on the ship. Oh yeah, sure, sure. Yeah. Had matting alongside, torpedo would hit. If it did, <laughs> she would maneuver too. She wasn't just taking it; she would maneuver. So that was happening off the Isle of Man. Yeah. Any other questions? Well, thank you all so very, very much. And if you're interested in a copy of the book, it's over there. Watch. This has been another in our series of webcasts produced by the Royal Canadian Military Institute in Toronto as a public educational service. You can find news of upcoming events and links to our webcast archives at www.rcmi.org. On behalf of the RCMI, this is Eric Morse saying goodbye for now and thank you for joining us.